Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're now going to hear Bill give us a talk about um, annotation, which is how we learn what our metagenomes can do. Bill, are you ready? Bill, are you ready? Can you hear us, Bill? Technical difficulties. No, oh, I can't hear you because I have no. turned off my speaker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's an easy technical difficulty to fix. <laughs> Great. Are you ready, Bill? Sure. Okay. Okay, let me bring this up. That's the wrong one. Okay, and am I sharing the right thing? We see your notes. Of course you do. Okay, how about now? Good. Excellent. Okay, so I guess I'm just jumping right in. It's me again. Hi, uh, this presentation will be about annotation of metagenomic sequence data. And uh, I just decided to call it, what's in a metagenome? So, uh, we're going to start by talking about just what is annotation, uh, and then we'll get into the guts of how do you annotate metagenomic sequence, talking about sequence annotation, feature identification, feature annotation, uh, and in particular identifying the function of, of genes. And this is going to focus mostly on the methods that you'll see in the NMDC EDGE uh, pipeline. So this isn't going to be fully comprehensive of all annotation techniques that are out there. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit at the end on getting beyond just genome annotation, trying to go from your genome to your genes, to your functions, to your traits, turning information into knowledge. OK, so what is annotation? Dictionary definition to link information that describes, explains, or puts into context the source data. And so as a fun example here, uh, Esquire magazine used to have a column that they called the annotated profile, where one of the writers would write a column on a subject or subjects as shown here. And uh, then they would give that column to the actual subjects of the column to uh, mark up in any way that they wanted to. And so here you can see, but I didn't turn on my pointer. There we go. And so you can see uh, in the margins they have pictures and words. And so this is actually kind of a nice demonstration of what annotation is, because uh, it shows you, uh, one, that you know the, the, this metadata that you're uh, decorating your data with uh, has pointers to specific locations saying, oh, this piece of information relates to this piece of information. So that's sort of the linking aspect of annotation. Um, but it also shows that annotation can come in different forms. It can be text. It can be pictures, it can be, you know, so there's just different things, different types of things that you can use to, to annotate something. Okay. So when we're talking about genomic data, uh, our fundamental data is what's shown here, just a contig sequence data. And really the question is, what do you want to know? Um, there, as I said before, there are lots of things that genomic sequence data can tell you. And if you don't define your question well, you can really um, spiral off into endless analysis of, of genome or metagenome data. So you want to always be aware of the limitations of the processes that you're using. We talked about you know, some of the problems with the, um, uh, the technical things, technical side of sequencing before. Um, Different annotation methods will give you different answers. Uh, this is important to remember. 
um, using different databases, using different programs. Uh, so it's important to keep track of what you did for one thing and make sure that part of your annotation process is writing down uh, how you generated the data. And then keep that in mind when you're doing comparisons against other studies. You know, are these coming from an equivalent uh, annotation background? And is it appropriate to compare these two uh, data sets? Most bio bioinformatics um, only transfers information that's already known. So you've got a reference database, there's information on that, you compare your database against that one and transfer the information from the reference database to your data. So you may put that information into a new context by putting it on your uh, sample set, your data set, but you're not really generating new information. Um, and so that's another thing to keep in mind. And finally, uh, GIGO is a computer science uh, term that means garbage in, garbage out. All of these processes, uh, if you put in bad sequence data, if it's low quality sequence data, or if it's contaminated, uh, you're not going to get good results out. It's on the flip side, uh, if you use a database that um, is not high quality or uh, is obsolete or uh, just isn't appropriate for what you're trying to do, you're not going to get out good information. So um, always be mindful of trying to get the, the highest quality and most appropriate uh, tools and uh, do good data checking to make sure that you're generating good output. Annotation of nucleic acid data. So um, you can start um, thinking about uh, where you're going to put information on your metagenomic sequence data by thinking about the nucleic acid sequence data itself. Um, so typical annotations you might associate with the, at the nucleic acid level um, would be the source organism um, of the uh, material. Uh, maybe the type of molecule that you're looking at, is this a chromosome or an extra chromosomal element? and maybe the topology, if you happen to be able to determine that as a circular or linear molecule. Other typical annotations for nucleic acid data include some nucleotide, nucleotide composition information, percent GC um, is easy to calculate and uh, frequently a useful value to know. Um, there's a thing called GC skew, which I, I don't see too much in the literature, but it can be uh, an interesting thing to run. Um, it turns out in many bacteria, uh, the leading and lagging strands of replication have different GC contents. And so if you do this GC skew type of plot, it can help you identify the origin of replication for your organism. Doesn't work in all organisms, but uh, the ones that it does, it it's, can be interesting to take a look at. Uh, similarly, the trinucleotide skew, this is a technique where uh, you are looking at um, the nucleotide composition in windows across uh, your genome and comparing those windows against an analysis of the whole genome. So what you're looking for is regions of the genome that look a little different than the genome on average. And this can indicate uh, uh, horizontally transfer, or horizontally transferred regions into your genome. Another thing that lights up in this analysis is usually the ribosomal operons because the, the nucleotide composition for non-coding genes is, is necessarily different than coding genes, but, but those are things that you can identify uh, using a, a, a skew type of analysis. Uh, and then another thing that you're going to decorate your nucleic acids data, of course, is with the genetic features uh, that you're going to identify. So what are some features that you might want to try and find? Well, of course, your coding regions, your genes, uh, maybe uh, control regions in front of those genes like promoters or uh, operators, repressors. You can look for non-coding uh, regions like ribosomal RNA operons or tRNAs or other non-coding RNAs. You could look for mobile elements uh, like insertion sequences or prophages. Um, you can look for uh, CRISPR regions um, or just other types of repeat regions that occur in your genome sequence. And there are some other operational genetic loci like the origin of replication that uh, could be useful or important to decorate your sequence with. So when you are identifying these uh, genetic features, there are a couple of uh, aspects of the annotation that you want to include. Um, obviously, you want to include the location in the genome. 
um, which molecule, which contig, which chromosome, whatever uh, it's on, and the coordinates and the strand, if that's an important uh, part of the uh, features functionality. And then the, the type of feature also, of course, uh, is it a coding gene, non-coding gene, all those ones we just went over uh, on the previous slide. And then the function of the feature. And this can be considered at two different levels. Uh, you can think about the direct biochemical action of uh, your protein, if, especially if it's an enzyme. What is it actually doing? What are the um, substrates and what are the products? But you can also think about uh, proteins in terms of their involvement in some sort of measurable trait for the organism. So uh, you may have an alcohol dehydrogenase or you know, a glucokinase that's involved in glycolysis. And so that's considering it at the biochemical level and at the, at the trait level. Gene finding. So if you're going to go in and find genes uh, and, and here I'm talking more about uh, the coding genes. The first thing you want to find out is what's what's not a coding region. Um, it's usually uh, easier and quicker to find those and masking those out early in the process can simplify the coding gene finding process downstream. So uh, one good practice is to identify and mask low complexity regions uh, in the genome, just you know, polynucleotide tracks, low complexity repeats, that kind of thing. Um, it's unlikely that real genes exist within or overlap these types of regions. And so you can use a filter like DUST, uh, to, uh, which is available through the NCBI BLAST package, uh, to filter a FASTA file, um, and that will mask all of the uh, low complexity regions. And by mask, what I mean is it just replaces the actual sequence with just a series of ends um, that, that would, is then going to be ignored by other programs that are looking for other genes. Then you can identify and mask your non-coding genes. Um, and again, coding genes rarely overlap non-coding genes. For looking for uh, ribosomal RNAs, um, there are a number of good uh, Markov models out there, hidden Markov models. Uh, this is just a, a type of uh, compositional model um, that you can search that sequence against, and it will uh, identify where uh, the regions are that, that are uh, the ribosomal RNAs. You can also find ribosomal RNAs using BLAST. They're not hard to find, but um, it can be difficult to determine what the, the margins, the precise coordinates of your uh, ribosomal region is from a BLAST search. So these models can be uh, more accurate. If you're looking for tRNAs, there's a program called tRNA Scan SE, which has been sort of the de facto standard for probably a decade. Uh, it's a great program, very robust, hasn't changed much over the years. Um, if you're looking for other non-coding uh, RNAs, there's a database called RFAM that currently has over 4,000 uh, different RNAs that have been classified. Many of them are organism-specific or eukaryotic and, you know, uh, sort of extraneous to a bacterial analysis, but, um, but that's the database that you would go to to find those. And then there are several CRISPR finders that have been published um, that can identify your CRISPR regions. And the two that are in NMDC Edge, I, I believe, are CRTCLI and CRISPR finder. So we found our non-coding regions, and now we want to find our coding regions. And that comes down to uh, from the available open reading frames or ORFs. Uh, in which one is the correct one? And the difficulty in identifying correct or varies uh, and uh, across organisms. And I'm demonstrating that showing uh, here we've got genome region view uh, this is the NCBI uh, genome viewer uh, from a high GC organism, which is about 65% and a low GC organism. It's about 30 and a half percent. And in this display, uh, the green vertical bars, if you can see them, uh, they're kind of small. Those are represent start codons. The red vertical bars represent stop codons. We're looking at all six uh, coding frames, the three forward and three reverse. And the um, blue boxes with arrows are representing the open reading frames that begin at a start, end at a stop, and meet a certain length criteria. So what I want you to see uh, in this slide is that looking at the low GC organism, you should notice that there are many, many more stop codons um, that are present in the low GC organism. And that 
makes sense if you think about it for a moment. Your stop codons are AT rich. Um, and so if you have an AT rich organism, you're just going to have uh, more stop codons that are that are showing up. Uh, and this actually makes it much easier uh, to go through here and look at the potential CDSs, you know, just your ORF regions and say, oh, well, here's some nice long open rating frames. These are probably the ORFs. Whereas in the high GC organism, you've got many more open rating frames that meet the, the length criteria anyway um, that uh, you would have to choose from. And, um, you know, this, this holds for the algorithms that are going to be doing this as well as like how many choices do they have to evaluate, uh, which can make gene finding in high GC organisms more tricky than for low GC organisms. So there's a couple different ways to do gene prediction. Um, the one that most people use and is probably the easiest are these ab initio methods um, that use machine learning or probabilistic models uh, to identify where the, which ORF is the CDS. And that includes programs like Prodigal, Glimmer, and GeneMark. Uh, all three of these programs work quite well. Um, I've, I've found that uh, in many things, like many things in bioinformatics, easy things are easy and hard things are hard. Um, so um, if you looked at it, you, you would definitely get slightly different gene predictions running these three, but most, uh, probably 95% of the gene calls would, would match precisely between those three. So uh, not a, you know, it's just up to you to choose which one you want to use. And you may find you know, specific cases where one works significantly better than another, but, but in general, I've found that they work pretty similarly. Um, another method that's used is you can use uh, RNA-seq or ESTs to guide your gene finding. This is used mainly in eukaryotes where the gene structure is much more complex, where you've got lots of introns and exons and you need to try and identify you know, where all these things are and which ones link together. Uh, for that, having transcriptome data it can be very useful. And so there's programs like EST to Genome and Augustus that will do that sort of thing for you. Um, if you're glutton for punishment, you can do the brute force protein homology search, where essentially you're just, you know, blasting your genome against some protein database. Um, that one takes a lot of parsing on the far end, uh, so that's not really used too much anymore. For your protein annotation, I always think about it as, uh, you know, sort of like a detective investigation where what you want to do is collect evidence about your protein and then at the end you draw your conclusions. So what kinds of evidence are we going to collect? Some of the clues to your function could include localization signals, and by this I mean uh, where is your protein going to be expressed in the cell? Um, this is can be a more interesting question in eukaryotic cells that have more compartmentalization, uh, but there, there's still some level of compartmentalization in bacterial cells, and um, sometimes that can be uh, helpful to try and identify what your protein is doing. Similarity to other proteins, and here I'm talking about uh, pairwise alignments. Functional family membership. Uh, this I'm talking more about um, tools uh, and data sets uh, that are, rely mostly on, on HMMs, things like PFAM, um, and then also presence of functional domains. Uh, and in particular, you know, maybe you can identify some cofactor binding sites that can help you figure out what your protein is doing. So let's go over these. So your cellular location in bacteria, um, you can look for proteins that might be uh, membrane proteins by looking for transmembrane alpha helices. And there's programs like TMM, HMM, TMHMM and TMPRED that will identify those for you. Proteins that are going out into the paraplasm, um, so across the inner membrane, <clears throat> will have a signal peptide on them. And signal P and phobias will find the different types of signal peptide. The SEC ones or the uh, twin arginine motifs um, can be found by TATP, TATFIND, and also signal P. Maybe your protein is a lipoprotein, gets a, a lipid attached to it at some point. Lipid attachment sites can be identified with the lipo P. Or maybe your protein is fully secreted, uh, which uh, there's several programs out there that will identify signals that indicate your protein has made it successfully all the way out of the cell and is now floating around the environment. Similarity to other proteins, um, the tools that you would use to uh, calculate this would be your blasts. 
Um, there's also a program called Diamond, uh, which does largely the same thing Blast does, but a thousand times faster, which can be useful um, for the larger database sizes that you have now. Uh, I know there's new versions of Blast that are also have also been accelerated. Um, the databases that you would search against, um, you want these to uh, have as high a quality um, as, as you can. Um, so some of the ones that I like to use, uh, Uniprot is a great database because uh, the information in it, uh, a lot of the information in it is, is curated. Um, so there's a high uh, accuracy. Uh, and it's also very rich in terms of the different types of metadata that are associated with the proteins in Uniprot. So there's a lot of information that you can transfer from the reference database to your protein. NCBI RefSeq is also another nice resource um, because they have taken um, data from complete genomes and run it through a consistent annotation pipeline. Um, so from the con concept of making sure that if you're going to do comparisons, you have consistency, uh, having this consistent pipeline is, is a nice feature uh, of RefSeq. Um, if you really have sequence that's like way out there and is not showing up in Uniprot or RefSeq, and you're like, give me all of the sequences that anyone knows about, well, then you would go to the NCBI NR database. Uh, it's really, really comprehensive, um, but the large size means you have uh, slower search times, and it can also be difficult to sift through the results because there are so many entries in it. Uh, the upsides of similarity search tools, uh, the databases are updated frequently. You know, people deposit sequences all the time, so there's new stuff coming in. Um, and the databases are very large, so it's going to be comprehensive. You're very likely to get a result when you do a search of a protein against one of these databases. Downsides of these, uh, again, uh, the biased composition, uh, just, you know, scientific investigation, what gets funded, that's what you have information on and is in the database. Um, and so uh, information that may be um, irrelevant to your line of investigation may be present in the database. And so that might be preferentially pushed on you and could be you know, not useful to you. Uh, transitive errors we'll talk about in a second. Um, but the very large databases can also be a downside uh, because of the uh, difficulty in parsing the output and the search times that are available. So what is a transitive error? Uh, and why is this a problem with, with pairwise searches? So I've got two examples of transitive errors going on right here. So uh, what I have represented here is an alignment of your protein of interest against a reference protein. And this happens to be a good alignment. These vertical bars are showing all the areas where these two are similar. These two proteins are very similar. And that's great. Um, it's a good hit. But the problem is that the reference, for whatever reason, has an incorrect annotation associated with it. And you don't know that. You just search your protein and said, great, I got this great hit. I'm going to transfer this annotation over to my protein. Well, now your protein has an incorrect annotation. And to compound the problem, you've now submitted your data, your protein to uh, a reference database. And now it's in there. And there's two proteins with incorrect annotation that someone else could search against and propagate that annotation further. So that's the good alignment, bad annotation, transitive error. Uh, the other type of transitive error you can have, um, you've got you know sort of a, a moderately good alignment you know your protein hits this reference protein and this reference protein is called atp binding protein uh, and the problem is that uh, where the atp binding domain uh, that part of the reference protein your protein doesn't really align that well to that region of the protein but overall if you look at the overall you know e value or bit score you're like oh no that's a pretty good hit um, so this is the good annotation but bad alignment uh, problem of transitive annotation. So you call your protein ATP binding protein when it really doesn't have that ATP binding domain. Um, so those that's the type of transitive error that you need to watch for uh, when you're evaluating pairwise alignments. Functional family membership uh, and functional domains, I sort of lumped these together into one. The tools that you would use for this are things like Hammer or the uh, Rapid Annotation of Sequences tool, RAST, or Interpro uh, collects a whole bunch of different um, family classification techniques together into one tool. The databases that you would uh, search again using these tools against would be uh, the PFAM family of uh, HMM models. And so HMM models, again, are compositional models. They, they look at uh, all of the proteins in a protein family 
or in this case, they're actually modeling functional domains. So all of the proteins that have a functional domain, they look at the sequence of that functional domain and the uh, sequence composition that makes up that functional domain is modeled. Uh, and then you can search your protein against that and identify those domains. TigerFam is also HMMs, but instead of modeling functional domains, they're trying to model uh, complete proteins end to end. KOFAM uh, is similar to TigerFAMs. Uh, it's HMMs based on the KEG orthology families that the KEG database has uh, generated. A little different is the seed database. This is actually KAMER based, it's not HMMs. Um, they've identified, and a KAMER is just a subsequence of your protein. Um, so they have these uh, look for unique subsequences sub that only exist in a particular functional family. And then if your protein has that KAMER that's only been observed in this functional family, they can classify it as a member of that family. Cath fun fam uh, is based on structural domains. So this is coming out of um, you know, the uh, crystal structure data, um, identifying families based on those structures and then making HMMs to recognize those. Uh, super family similarly is based on SCOP, the structural classification of proteins, another one that's uh, looking at full length proteins. And then you may also be familiar with COG or eggnog uh, is the updated version of that now. This was um, families that were generated by an NCBI global clustering protocol. Um, and they have, uh, the eggnog release currently has both HMMs and databases that you can do uh, like a, a diamond or blast search against to determine family membership. And one of the nice things that people like about uh, the COGS is that uh, in addition to the individual protein family uh, designations, the protein families um, have also been given uh, functional categories, higher level functional categories, which lets you do some convenient classification of your results. Um, you know, saying, oh, these are all the, um, you know, nitrogen metabolism genes. These are all the amino acid biosynthesis genes. So just ways of summarizing your data that's convenient. So the upsides, of these protein classification tools uh, is that the output is highly curated. Um, because the data sets are a little smaller, they can be faster than the pairwise alignments. And the output is uh, frequently easier to interpret uh, than looking at a uh, last pairwise alignment, or at least a long series of them if you're trying to uh, see how conserved your protein is. The downsides are that um, because these are highly curated, uh, it takes time and effort to build them. So the, uh, they have limited catalogs. They're, they're not gonna be comprehensive covering all of the genes um, that are out there. And this also means there's a slower rate of update uh, versus just the sequence deposition that happens for the pairwise uh, uh, FASTA databases. And another um, downside is that um, because these Again, because these require people to curate them, if the project gets a loss of support, uh, then you get orphan tools and they don't get updated at all anymore. Uh, and that's that's a problem that's happened to TigerFam. It's still a good database and, and robust, uh, but it's sort of languished for you know probably the last 10 years. I think NCBI has now picked it up and they might work on developing it some more, but um, it has not been significantly updated in some period of time. So we've collected our evidence. Uh, we've gone through, here we have our protein represented by the gray bar at the top, and we've searched it against a number of different things. And we have a tiger fam hit that you see spans the entire way. You can see a couple of functional domains that are recognized by PFAM. Uh, we've got this uh, super family uh, hit down here. We've determined that it has a signal peptide. And we've also run this against TMHNM and found all these transmembrane helices. And so we look at all the information that's associated with these accessions in these various databases. And we can now say, it's elementary. I look at all this information and I've concluded that this protein is the vitamin B12 transporter BTUB. Boom, congratulations, we've solved the case. Um, the type of, uh, you know, there's no one aspect of annotation. The annotation is many different things. And so see, these are some of the typical things you will see in a in the annotation that's associated with a protein. So of course, you have a product name. What is this protein? 
DNA polymerase three. The gene symbols are another thing that are, are frequently put in there. So like REC A, uh, an enzyme commission number. Uh, if you have an enzyme, uh, these series of numbers describe uh, specifically what that protein will do. And there are other ontologies. Um, there's a set called the gene ontology, and you can assign uh, three terms to a protein um, describing the molecular function, the biological process, and the cellular component. The go terms just kind of look like this. They're just a string of numbers. Um, but the molecular function term will uh, describe you know, the, the reaction that is catalyzed by that uh, protein. The biological process will describe the biological process that the protein is involved in, obviously, and the cellular component where it's found in the cell. And so between those three things, you can see that very specifically describes what a protein is doing for a cell. And then the, the point behind the gene ontology terms is getting an object like this rather than just putting out a name like DNA polymerase is this is more of a computational object. And so if you want to downstream, try and do, uh, you know, have programmatically evaluation of uh, what your cellular function is, um, something like a Go term is gonna be easier for the computer program to understand than uh, a free text field. There are also other ontologies out there uh, that you can uh, associate with your proteins. There's a couple for transporters, the transporter classification database, TCDB, or the transport DB. There's also KZ for your carbohydrate active enzymes. Uh, and there's one out there for proteases as well. So there's some other uh, types of ontologies that you can associate with those. And in fact, you know, many of the the evidence types that we were talking about before, the, the um, HMM accessions um, are de facto ontologies as well. So when it's not so elementary, when you don't have good evidence um, for your proteins function, uh, you will get, you'll wind up seeing um, a lot of different uh, annotations. Uh, and this is, this is what some of these terms mean. Um, so if you see something that says, you know, like arc A family protein, that means what you have is a member of a family that's defined, defined by sequence similarity. Um, but there may be multiple known functions within that family, or maybe no known function within that family. So you just know that it's you know, got sequence similarity to something that's named. And so it's a member of that family. Uh, similarly, uh, if you've got an align a good alignment to uh, part of a protein, you may only have a domain protein, um, like a PAS domain protein, or a, this is domain of unknown function, DUF. And that means you have a domain, um, but uh, either the function of the domain is unknown in the case of the DUF, or the domain function is known, but it doesn't fully describe the protein function. So, you know, this is an area that phosphorylates something, but we don't really know what it phosphorylates. Uh, it's a past domain protein. If you really have no evidence indicating any function, you will typically see something like hypothetical protein or uncharacterized protein. Back in the bad old days, um, we would get proteins uh, that we would blast them against NCBI and you would get no hits. Um, and at that point you were questioning whether this was just a bad gene call. Uh, maybe the gene caller gave you a bad gene call. Um, and so, uh, if we had uh, alignments to other proteins, but all of those proteins were hypothetical proteins, we would call it a conserved hypothetical protein. Um, if we didn't have any alignment at all, we'd call it a hypothetical protein. I don't know if conserved hypothetical protein is still used with the size of the databases now. It seems really unlikely you're going to do a blast search and not come up with anything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm really not sure that term is used anymore. Another term you might see is putative that would be tagged at the end of an annotation. And that just means that there is functional evidence, but it's kind of weak. So they're hedging their bets about whether uh, that protein truly has that activity or whether they just you know, say, well, maybe it does. So it's, it's a putative alcohol dehydrogenase, whatever. Okay. So if you do an annotation, um, there's, there's only so much we know um, and so you, you can't expect that you're going to get every gene to have um, a high quality annotation associated with it. And to demonstrate this, I took the genome of E. coli K12 MG1655, probably the best characterized organism in the world. 
and said, you know, what's the annotation that's that currently on this organism? So it's got 4,300 proteins. Uh, if you look at tiger fam hits, that covers about 40% of the proteins there. And again, these are generally full length proteins. Um, PFAM is domains, uh, functional domains. So that actually covers more of the proteins, about 93%. Uh, but it's important to remember that 384 of those are hits to duff models uh, where the function is actually unknown. Uh, similarly, KO fam hits 3,800 of them, about 84%, uh, but also KO fams have a certain number of models um, that are uncharacterized proteins. So if you go in and look uh, at the product descriptors and look for low information annotations, 32% uh, of the genes in E. coli uh, have something like putative or duff or uncharacterized family protein, domain containing protein, right? So 30, fully 30% 30 of the organism, we don't really know what it does, right? And this is E. coli. So it only gets worse from here. Um, so it's not unusual for you to take your genome, run it through annotation processes, and still have, uh, you know, 40 to 50% of the proteins that you, you don't really have a good idea of what they're doing, just to adjust your expectations. Um, and even if you don't have genomes, if you're looking at a metagenome, meta um, you're going to have a lot of unknown uh, protein functional sequence space. Annotation is not the end of the journey. Uh, of course, that's just the, the beginning of trying to do the rest of your analysis. Uh, so putting that information into the context of uh, the other genes in a genome, for instance, or putting it in the context of the environment from which you took your metagenome is, is important. Integration of your metagenomic data with other data types can be key to uh, figuring out um, what your organisms are doing or how your community is operating. So a couple of ways that you can put your annotation into context include metabolic reconstruction, or just putting your genes into a metabolic map, or you can build uh, metabolic models. And we'll talk about both of those in a second. <clears throat> you can also integrate with other omics types, or you could even you know, have comparisons against uh, enzyme assays, or um, even Amplicon community structure uh, or dynamics data. So um, KEG has some tools if you do have uh, keg terms as part of your annotation output. You can take those to keg and plug them into the keg mapper and get nice little maps like this where uh, they've got a base uh, metabolic map that shows uh, available or you know possible reactions and they'll light up in green the uh, reactions from your organism uh, that you input to see uh, how that lays over the, the metabolic map. So this is just a simple TCA cycle. Uh, and you can identify where there are holes. You can see where your organism might um, have a different uh, route through some metabolism than some other organisms. And so those can be uh, nice visualizations, especially if you're interested in a particular metabolism. There's also a tool called IPATH available through EMBL. Um, and this has uh, these more global maps uh, but similarly, you can uh, input a number of different ontologies. I know they take KO, but also EC numbers and um, a couple other ontology types, um, but you can feed those in and um, they will light up the specific pathways that, that you fed into it to see you know, which of these pathways you have in your organism. And you can even uh, put in multiple layers of data. So you could put in a metagenomic data set and say, these are all the available pathways. And then I also did this metatranscriptome at this one time. And these are the genes that were being transcribed under some condition and have that all in this, a display like this. And so that's pretty handy. You can also take um, your sequences to KBase, uh, a DOE uh, yeah, funded tool uh, that's available to anyone on the web. And the, uh, they've been developing this for 10 to 15 years now with the initial purpose was to make it easier for um, people doing genomic sciences to uh, build metabolic models and test them. And so uh, there are many, many tools available 
at uh, KBase for building models, running flux balance analysis, uh, being able to test, um, you know, or predict, um, will my organism grow on a certain carbon source uh, based on these models that you can build and curate within the KBase uh, ecosystem there. So uh, yeah, I think I am now done um, and I am happy to take questions you might have about uh, annotation techniques and strategies. Bill, there's a question in the chat um, asking about plasmids. Um, once the person wants to know how would he how would I bin or know which contigs or scaffolds are plasmids? Um, so there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, one of them is that usually your plasmids uh, that are within a, you know, it's this will sort of depend. So um, if you've got a genome sequence and you've got a plasmid inside that genome, um, plasmids are usually maintained at a different copy number uh, than the base chromosome. So you'll wind up with different uh, depth of coverage for those contigs. Um, and that can be detectable in metagenomic data sets as well. Usually you'll have really high um, coverage on, on those plasmid contigs. Uh, and so it's not necessarily difficult. And there's also uh, usually suites of genes that are present on those contigs that can indicate that it's a plasmid sequence and not genomic. There's a Question from Catherine Nasco in Discord. Um, first, she says that she always loves hearing you talk, Bill. On slide <laughs> six, you discussed various annotations of nucleic acids. Which of these are possible in a genome sequence from a field soil sample? Are there typical annotations that are performed on taxonomic complex samples? Um, well, you'll, I, I would say uh, yes, and then you'll see a little bit of that in the NMDC edge pipeline later. Um, in terms of uh, doing the read-based taxonomic classification. Um, it's, it's harder to get to things uh, like topology, um, if that's what you're referring to, from you know, when you're not getting a closed genome sequence out. Uh, but um, the, and you know, some of those other things that I talked about really are, only make sense in the context of uh, having a closed genome. Um, although the trinucleotide skew, it's, it's possible if you had a mag that you could do that uh, with the mag sequence and try and identify something that looks a little unusual. But um, if you've got just a single contig that has an unusual composition uh, and it's not part of a larger contig, um, then it's unlikely that that will properly be binned into your mag uh, with the rest of the sequence data. So. Great, thank you. Um, also from Discord, Dr. Abiesk asks in Keg Mapper, what does the gray boxes, what do the gray boxes signify? So um, yeah, like a, they've got um, pathway maps that they've generated that show um, across all organisms, uh, all the available reactions or all the described reactions that are there. And so when you uh, lay your reactions in, it highlights in some other color um, the ones that are in your organism. So the other boxes on those maps would be um, known pathways that are not present in your organism in, in the example that I was showing. Thanks. From Abigail K. How long does it take to annotate a full genome? Do you check every call from every program to look for the potential issues you described? Um, well, I, I come from a background of, you know, I worked at the, the Institute for Genomic Research uh, and our, our whole thing was manual curation of bacterial genomes, uh, which is something that just isn't done anymore. So, so I have a biased uh, idea of like what a good genome annotation is uh, and how much you should pers you know manually um, take a look at these things. So um, yeah, it, it's it's a bit of an open-ended question. You're not really ever done annotating a, a genome. Um, you have to decide what uh, you know set some limits on yourself um, to uh, you know say what what do I want to know and and uh, what techniques am I going to use to get to that answer. 
because the data changes all the time. There are new tools released every month, you know, in several journals. Um, so you can spend quite a bit of time. But um, if you're just talking about doing um, a baseline annotation run, you know, just generating some information, uh, the pipelines that are available today can run in a day or two, you know, probably less than a day now, uh, the NMDC pipeline. And what was it taking care in like 12, 13 hours, I think, for the for the edge pipeline to run? Um, annotation for a metagenome is pretty complex and very computationally intensive. So it takes a, a lot of resources to run um, all of these tools in parallel, even chunk, you know, chunking out different uh, sections of the assembled contigs and um, I, yeah I would I would say 12 hours probably is easily in it yeah it, would yeah, be a, you're right. would it be a will, minimum for metagenomes it will totally depend on on how much data yeah. you have yeah. um, uh, but for 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 if you're just talking a genome or a mag um, you know generating the information doesn't really take much more than a day I would say uh, but then you know the downstream analysis of the information that you generate it's a lot of data that you generate so um the downstream analysis time highly depends on on what your question is and how deep you want to get into it all right it looks like we have one more different tools give different annotation results how can we decide which tool would be best mm, yeah that uh, i don't think there's necessarily a good answer for that um it's yeah. Um, tools can it, I find practically people choose tools based on how easy they are to use, um, because it's very difficult to have gold standards and say this tool, you know, certainly works better than this tool. Uh, so you just get different answers, but you, you're it's hard to know which one is going to be more correct. Um, and so uh, pe people have a tendency to choose uh, based on, you know, I was able to install this one and get it to run. Um, or, you know, this gives me, you know, output in the form that I like and that facilitates other analysis that I'm going to do downstream. Um, yeah, so I, I'm afraid I don't have a better answer than that for, for trying to choose like what is the best tool to use for uh, annotation. So, um, so something like, uh, it's it's a it's a strong argument for running several tools and then trying to integrate across all of that information. Like I said, collect your evidence and draw your conclusions. Great, I think that's the last of our questions, and we're good to move on. All right. 